All right, people, welcome back to the Hoplite channel. I am your host, Hop. Uh, appreciate uh, your return for this video, Samurai Lit Primer Part 2. So uh, in, this, in the first video of the uh, Samurai Lit Primer series, I uh, left off um, with an explanation of the eight virtues of Bushido, uh, which is the warrior's way. It is the um, playbook, uh, for lack of a better term, the, um, the instruction manual of the life of a samurai, uh, of a warrior um, during the, uh, the time of the samurai in Japan. And um, for Primer Part 2, I thought I would flesh out more of the origin of the samurai, uh, who they were, where they came from, uh, why they no longer exist, and how they functioned in um, you know, feudal Japan in that society. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, uh, bushi uh, translates to warrior uh, in Japanese. So where did the term samurai come from? Well, uh, in usage in this time, uh, they had another word, uh, was uh, sebo rao. Uh, and I'm sure if I, if I mispronounce these words, I'm sure our Japanese friends will correct me if, if they're in the comments. So uh, bear with me uh, for the uh, Western gaijin uh, for butchering these words. Uh, but sebo rao uh, meant to wait upon or to attend someone as in a servant. Um, this uh, gave way to a word called saburai, which was those who wait upon you, someone who waits upon someone else, an attendant, a servant. And a samurai was those who wait upon the nobility. So we could say that uh, a bushi is a warrior, but a samurai is a warrior who serves and waits upon the nobility class, uh, which makes sense because the samurai class uh, in themselves were considered part of the nobility. Although by today's standards, you could say they were more like middle class. Um, in the sense that you could look at the warrior class in America today or in the West as soldiers, um, uh, police officers, uh, people, you know, first responders um, when it comes to anything that can involve violence. Uh, but the samurai were upper class in feudal Japan uh, and they lived um, uh, an upper class lifestyle but also a martial lifestyle uh, that was different uh, from the classes that were above them. Uh, so anyway, the uh, samurai era, as it were, uh, was uh, roughly uh, from the 12th century through the 19th century. Now, it, be it began a little bit before this, but you couldn't say it was official uh, in Japan as a, um, a, a nobility class until around the 12th century, and they were firmly established. And they lasted all the way up until the 19th century. And if you know the, from the movie The Last Samurai, uh, in the late 1800s is when the samurai uh, pretty much had their swan song. They were no longer a viable means of defending a country in another sense that they were dedicated to this Bushido, this code of, of, of martial uh, prowess, of military tradition. But it was so steeped in tradition, it was not catching up with the times uh, that uh, Western culture w was bringing to the world, and that was mostly gunpowder uh, and um, uh, motorized uh, cavalry units. So the samurai were still on horseback shooting arrows and swinging swords, where the Western militaries of the world uh, were using rifles, cannons, gatling guns, and warships. So uh, this was um, this, this turn of events in technology is essentially what uh, put the, um, the sunset on the age of the samurai in Japan was when Japan had to embrace uh, the Western methodologies of warfare. Uh, and they had to, otherwise uh, it would have been the end of them. But during this period, uh, the samurai class was a hereditary uh, nobility, which means that uh, if you were born in this class, that was essentially how you became a samurai. Uh, the records indicate there's, there's possible instances where you could be adopted by a samurai family, uh, though coming from a different family you could inherit uh, that uh, lifestyle, uh, the, the caste. However, uh, the primary, um, the primary uh, mode in which people became samurai was they were born into a samurai family and their father passed uh, this 
uh, lifestyle, this cast down to their sons, the fathers to the sons. Right. Uh, so in the 15th century, the samurai class reached its apex. Uh, it, was, it was the halcyon days of being a samurai. And it was, uh, the caste was 10% uh, roughly of the total population of Japan, which is pretty sizable if you consider it. Um, so the more famous um, endeavors of the samurai over this period were, um, number one, we see the invasions of Korea and China. This took part largely in the late 1500s, 1590s. Um, I myself visited, um, I've been to Tokyo and I've been to Seoul, Korea. And in Korea, if you go to, I'm going to butcher this as well, if you go to a palace in uh, central Seoul, I believe it's called uh, Gyeongbokgung Palace, uh, and you walk around the palace grounds, certain walls uh, are dedicated to uh, particular battles. And more than, I, I want to say, there's at least six different sections of the palace that show this is where the Japanese invaded in this year. So uh, the, the samurai were uh, central in the invasions of Korea and China uh, during this period. Um, and they led a lot, a lot of those efforts, although the, obviously the samurai weren't the only warriors on the ground uh, during these invasions. But uh, towards the end of certain shogunates, um, uh, many shoguns became uh, anxious to expand Japan's military power uh, beyond its borders and to do that through conquest. And that's when Shintoism became more central to the Bushido uh, code and less so uh, Zen Buddhism or Taoism. But another um, uh, era of the samurai that was um, something that was uh, incredible uh, was their resistance to the Mongol invasions. And this happened uh, between 1270 and 1280 for the most part. Now, if you're uh, a student of history as I am, you understand the, the Mongols were no joke. Um, I think it was said that uh, over half of China has a common ancestor in Genghis Khan. And it means he was pretty busy uh, once the sun went down, if you know what I mean. And uh, the Mongols raped and pillaged all over uh, Central and Eastern Asia, as well as uh, in um, Eastern and Central Europe. But the samurai class uh, was um, incredible in their ability to resist the Mongol invasions of Japan, uh, so much so that uh, Genghis Khan was never able to fully take any significant gains uh, on the island of Japan because of the samurai class and their ability to coordinate military defenses against such an invasion. Um, and it just so happens that around this period in 1270, 1280, the late 13th century, uh, was when uh, Zen Buddhism um, had found its way into the practice of Bushido and had woven itself into the teachings of many samurai at the time. As I said later though, of course, in the invasions, uh, the samurai uh, masters and shoguns took a more militaristic approach towards Bushido and wanted to use it as an aggressive military measure versus one that was a reaction or defensive. And that was with Shintoism. And we'll get to Zen Buddhism uh, through the readings and teachings of Takon Soho uh, to his friend, uh, the samurai and swords master uh, Yagyu Munanori uh, in later sections. So... How did the society of um, Japan and, and feudal Japan break down in the age of the samurai? Well, this uh, pyramid short, will dictate the caste system and where you stacked up in feudal Japan uh, if you lived in that time. So at the top of the pyramid, no surprise, was the emperor of Japan, right? He, he was number one. Uh, if you were the emperor, uh, you were the sole sovereign body uh, of uh, Japan, you were the incarnate spirit of Japan, uh, so similar to um, the emperor of Rome uh, in, in the Western world. The emperor of Japan, the emperor of Rome, they were number one in their respective societies. And then below him, you had the royal court of the emperor. These would be the uh, emperor's immediate family, extended family, uh, the secretaries, the advisors, uh, the council, 
those that the emperor brought into his royal court were his administration. So you could say that um, if the emperor lived in the palace, those in his immediate employ who lived around the palace or in the palace with him were just below him in the hierarchy. And then next you have the shogun. The shogun can be considered like the, uh, the, the, the five-star general of uh, feudal Japan. And there was only one. Uh, there was no joint chiefs of staff. There was one shogun. And a shogunate was considered uh, a fiefdom within the emperor's domain. In, the, in that to mean the shogun operated within the government of feudal Japan under the emperor with uh, significant autonomy. And as long as the emperor was satisfied with the shogun keeping peace within Japan and perhaps expanding Japanese power uh, abroad, the shogun was uh, often left to run feudal Japan as he saw fit in a militaristic sense. And then below the shogun, you have the daimyo. And again, I apologize if I, if I butcher these words. I'm just pronouncing them as I think they should sound. The daimyo were um, the feudal lords who lived throughout Japan and owned sizable properties. So if you want a modern day uh, equivalent, you could say that they were kind of like the heads of the families. And these daimyo had their own uji or clans which literally translates to birth blood. So if you were in the clan of a particular daimyo, uh, you uh, were situated on his property and you were paid a stipend for your services in his family. If you were brought in as a samurai, uh, you swore a blood oath to the daimyo and you were in his employ and you were also paid a salary, usually I believe they, they gave it a, a monthly stipend of rice. That was the, the measure of, of income. But uh, the, below the daimyo were, of course, the samurai. And the daimyo uh, employed many samurai, depending on his net worth. And a very powerful daimyo uh, could have anywhere from uh, 100 to 300 samurai in his employ. A lesser uh, wealthy daimyo could have anywhere from 20 to 50 samurai in his employ. Um, but um, a samurai uh, regarded the daimyo as his surrogate father. As if his father was no longer around, his daimyo was the feudal lord to which he, he swore uh, allegiance. That was his, his father in the spiritual sense. Uh, and a samurai who did not have a daimyo, we know them as ronin. These are, uh, ronin are, uh, translates to the masterless samurai. They wander looking for work. They hold themselves out for services that they could be used for, but they have no house, they have no uji any longer, uh, they are masterless samurai. They must uh, travel the roads and towns of Japan, in feudal Japan, looking for work, perhaps, perhaps uh, proving themselves to a daimyo and uji uh, that they come across and thereby winning their favor to join their clan. But a masterless samurai ronin had a very tough, uh, a very tough life to lead. Uh, they were hired guns and mercenaries, and um, they, uh, they were not well regarded in feudal Japan. To be a masterless samurai was uh, dishonorable. Um, and sometimes this happened through no fault of their own. But uh, in any event, below samurai, you have your merchants, your traders, your craftsmen. These are your, your blue collar workers, you know, your plumbers, your mechanics, your teachers, uh, your fishermen, your farmers, etc. And then below these, you have your peasants and your serfs. This is essentially the lowest class, almost a slave class. The peasants are people who had to work, you know, bent over in the rice fields every day for 10 to 15 hours a day, uh, getting paid just enough to live. And that was uh, the, the bottom section of the feudal Japan hierarchy pyramid. And that was the, uh, the world of the samurai. That, that was the world in which they lived. So they were considered upper class, but you can see the distinction between upper class and lower class, uh, it fell off pretty steep. Uh, once you were below a samurai, um, yeah, feudal Japan, it, it was a rather unforgiving um, time to live. Uh, not unlike um, how feudal England would have been or, or feudal Europe in, in France or Germany or Spain or um, these locales, uh, the king was king and the king's court was secondary to the king. And then you had bishops and you had priests, and these were the holy, the holy men, the holy class. 
in the emperor, the royal court, the, the holy class, the priest class would often be in the court. And then you had the shogun. These were the, you know, the, the barons, the earls. And then below them you would have uh, uh, the lords, the, the diamo. And then in the employ of the lords you would have the knights. And then below the knights you would have the craftsmen, the tradesmen, the farmers, the fishermen, etc. And then below you would have the serf class, the, the live-in slaves, uh, for lack of a better term. But uh, I'll, I'll get to um, the code of the knights in uh, a different series. But you can see how you know, two different cultures had a very similar feudal style, um, even though uh, the exposure uh, Japan had to Western culture and vice versa didn't happen until uh, many years later. And during this period, the exposure uh, was very limited. And that's another uh, point I should make is that um, many uh, members of the samurai class were very suspicious of outside influence. And Zen Buddhism, uh, as, along with Taoism, came from uh, parts of China with Confucianism. And in later years, in the 19th, closer to the 18th and 19th century, samurai began to suspect these outside influences. They thought they clouded the mind of the samurai in his bushido, in his pursuit of uh, military glory, and uh, was weak. Uh, so there was a lot of persecution uh, in the latter half of the samurai era for people who were uh, Buddhists and Taoists. And Shintoism is what eventually took over, which was considered the strong nationalistic spirit of Japan. Um, but uh, for the purposes of this primer series, uh, we'll cover the Bushido and uh, Zen, Buddhism's, Zen Buddhism's influence on Bushido. Uh, during the uh, age of the samurai. Uh, okay, I think that's a good place to stop here with part two of the primer. I'll go into part three for the next video and we'll talk uh, about Zen Buddhism, uh, its impressions on Bushido uh, and, and the samurai um, in, in their heyday. And then uh, we'll move on to uh, source materials, which again is the best part. And we'll re take readings from uh, Takuan Soho, Miyamoto Musashi, Yagyu Munanori, and others, uh, so that we can learn directly from the samurai uh, what they believed and how they believed uh, a samurai uh, with the Bushido uh, warrior code uh, as his life's guide uh, should behave. Uh, again, thanks for coming by. Um, give it a thumbs up if you're liking the, the series. If you're liking the channel, uh, please subscribe. Uh, tell your friends if you think they'd be interested. And uh, we'll see you next time. Till then, take it easy.